So, uh, thanks for coming, guys. I know it's, uh, it's cold out there, but um, my name is Brian Pace Braga. I'm a director at Fiore Group. Uh, I'm also a founder uh, of a company I think a lot of you are shareholders of. I see Robbie, who is a shareholder of Lithium X right there, early shareholder. Um, that company was sold last March for $265 million. We made early investors, including Rob and others in this audience, 15 times their money. Um, and uh, actually returned just over five times of invested capital. We raised just over 50 million and sold for $265 million. Um, right after that last year, what does any young guy do with a little bit of money? He gets into the film and television business. <laughs> so um, based on my partner, Frank Jusra, uh, convincing me to get into Thunderbird Films, uh, I made an investment and about halfway through last summer, we decided to raise $12 million from family and friends and take the company public. Uh, why did we make that investment? Why did I make that investment? Um, I think many of us know about Netflix and, and Amazon and, and this wave of streaming. Um, and we're gonna go through what that actually means today because I think some of us hear this word all the time and we actually don't understand the major shift that has happened in media. And what we like to do for your group is call trends. And uh, Rob Ballard was just mentioning macro trends. We believe content and the way that it's absorbed is a major trend. And I think I like to remind people that this, this iPad, this new device, which is really like the new television, only came out April 3rd, 2010. It was only eight years ago. The iPhone itself, which has sold over a billion and a half units around the world, that's one in every five people, has only been around for 20 years. So these are, these are monumental shifts that have happened in, uh, in media and the way that people actually absorb, absorb content. So today my, uh, my guest is Jennifer McCarran. She's the CEO, the fearless leader of Thunderbird. Um, and I wanna start with the question around streaming. And, and what does streaming actually mean? And, and who are the major players in it? Absolutely, so uh, thanks for having me here today. Um, and streaming, you might hear, hear it referred to as OTT, over the top. Um, and, you know, to Brian's point, when the iPad came out, April 3rd, 2010, it changed everything because suddenly you could watch content on any platform, anywhere, anytime. Um, you know, things like 4G uh, allowed content to be streamed so quickly. Now we're going to 5G. That's like going from a garden hose to a fire hose in terms of the content you can get. Um, versus uh, the traditional broadcaster, uh, which is, uh, you know, some of the um, cable corporations uh, where you need to go to a source to watch the shows. So um, in the traditional broadcast model, uh, the broadcaster just will decide what you get to watch and when. Uh, in the streaming model, or the OTT, you can watch whatever you want, whenever you want. Um, and the reason that, um, you know, the Netflix uh, led the charge and now we have Amazon, Apple. Uh, Apple comes online in March of 2019. So uh, your phone that I'm sure most of you guys have um, has a, an Apple TV on it. Um, they're creating all their own content for that. Um, and the reason everyone's getting into it is because the money is so lucrative. There's so much money to be made. Um, when Netflix... Uh, you know, came out with House of Cards and then Lionsgate's Orange is a New Black. They spent big money on original content to keep subscribers. Um, and that's why everyone wants a piece of it is because there's so much money to be made. And it feels like, to your point, that uh, why is this engine so strong of, of needing content is it's a competition of keeping subscribers. All these businesses are based on a multiple of them having these tens of millions or hundreds of millions of subscribers and it's a real fight, right, for those subscribers. So um, it's, it's amazing to think that, that over $15 billion will be spent on content just this year from a combined market cap of almost $2 trillion from these companies. Yeah. It's, it's unbelievable. So um, let me know how, 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 does, how does Thunderbird, a company that's under $100 million market cap, how does it play and how, and how do you keep these massive companies happy? Because they're your biggest customers. Absolutely. Um, so we were early movers in the space. Um, we, uh, you know, were sold Beatbugs, which was a show based on uh, Beatles music. So every 11-minute episode featured a song from the Beatles. 
um, and we sold that to Netflix. Uh, one of the first six original shows sold to Netflix. So we were early movers in the relationship, uh, cemented that then, we became trusted um, providers. And this is a game where quality will win. You know, House of Cards, Orange is the New Black, those shows, they spent millions of dollars upping the quality. Um, people want to subscribe for quality, great programming. Thunderbird was early movers in the space. Uh, when Beat Bugs went through, we had that relationship. Uh, we then optioned a New York Times bestseller, Last Kids on Earth. Uh, we went down one day in Los Angeles, pitched it to Disney, uh, and then Netflix. Disney made an offer on the spot. We drove across town. Netflix upped the offer. We sold it to Netflix. That was a great day, because it was October 3rd, 2017, and that was the day the Blade Runner premiere, um, uh, which Thunderbird also did, uh, Blade Runner 2049. And so, you know, that's why uh, if we're doing quality content with quality creatives and we're a proven entity that can deliver, when they come to Thunderbird, we've got the creative, we've got the creator, and we have a studio of almost 1,000 people in Vancouver, Ottawa, Los Angeles, the UK, that can execute on that content. It's a no-brainer. Plus, when you add in the Canadian tax credits that the government kindly supplies, it's, it's almost an unbeatable business model. Okay, so that's all the positive stuff. <clears throat> Walk me through um, the, the, the fear that some, I don't, I don't have kids yet, but I know you're, you're a mother of three. Um, what about the addiction to these devices? So I was, I was reading on the plane over here actually on Saturday, a uh, Wall Street Journal article <clears throat> that was talking about um, Generation Z and the addiction to, to tablets and to iPhones. Um, are you concerned about this? And how would this potentially change Thunderbird's business and how do you think it's changing the, the, the landscape of, of the media business? Uh, I am concerned about it. I think it's real. I think, um, you know, uh, screens are addictive. Um, I certainly suffer from it, even myself. I think kids need screen limits um, and that, you know, they need to go outside and play and be bored and it's up to the parent to try and enforce that. Uh, you know, at Thund as it pertains to Thunderbird, our mission is we want to you know, make content um, that makes the world a better place. So no guns, no gore, no violence. You know, we're not doing a first shooter game. And uh, you know, if parents can cook dinner quietly, <laughs> boil some potatoes safely, put on some content like you know, beat bugs, um, that's great for the kids, that's a win. And you know, you're wearing the Kim's Convenience jacket. I think nothing speaks stronger to that mission statement than Kim's Convenience in terms of uh, that is aspirational content that is showing you know, life through a different lens and couldn't be more proud of that. But certainly, I think it's something to watch and I think there'll be more attention in the years to come as people realize the har harmful effects of too much screen time. Well, I didn't realize how big Kim's convenience was, but when I checked into my hotel uh, on Saturday, um, a Korean lady checked me in and she said, I love that show. And I tried to take claim that I was the producer of it, but I don't know if she really believed me. But it was, it was, uh, it was amazing. It was amazing to see how, how loved that show is. And it was by, by a Korean, uh, Korean woman. And, and then in the show, it's a Korean uh, immigrant family, isn't it, that runs the... The grocery, Kim's, yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, okay, I want to talk about you as a, as a leader and as a young female leader and three young kids and busy as ever. But here's a few things that you've uh, gotten notoriety for. You, you mentioned you have a thousand employees. These are amazing, high-paying jobs. Um, you've won an Emmy, uh, an Emmy. You got just on Friday last week YMCA Woman of Distinction for British Columbia. <clears throat> you won Playback Executive of the Year, um, and you've been featured in the Global Mail as one of Canada's top twenty new leaders. I hope we don't lose you to Canada or to Ottawa this fall, <laughs> but if we if we do, that's okay. Um, how is it being a female executive in another? male-dominated industry? Uh, well, it's a great question. Um, I think I've been really lucky. Uh, most of my mentors have been male, so I've had great support. You know, um, Frank Joustra, who started Lionsgate, is uh, the primary investor. You know, you were kind enough to believe in me, Brian. Look at all the success you've had in, this, in these arenas. Uh, Yvonne Fasson, who built out CBC and CTV, is chairman of the board. Uh, Tim Gamble, who founded the company, is still involved today. So, you know, I, I talk to Tim every day. How lucky am I to be surrounded by these amazing male mentors? Um, 
in terms of being a female CEO, definitely I was, I think, typical female trepidatious about stepping forward. A lot of women don't step forward unless they think they're going to do a really good job. And I was worried that unless I really knew what I was doing, I didn't want to let anyone down. Um, you know, the, the board was pretty clear with me. You know, they said, what are you scared of? And I was like, well, losing everyone's money, <laughs> for one. Let's start with that. And, uh, and maybe not seeing my kids. And everyone said, well, you know, if we, if we don't, we're not a success. It's as much our problem as yours. And you have to make work work for you. Um, I also believe that the world would be a better place with more diverse leadership, not just females, but people from all ethnicities. And I think um, I have two girls and a son, and I always think, you know, if you can see it, you can be it. Yeah. And so there's, right now there's more CEOs in Canada named John than there are women. So um, just, I think, you know, the more people that step forward, the more that will um, become less of a unique thing and it'll become more normalized and I hope I can help be part of doing that in an inspirational you know, way. Um, <clears throat> this question about the old media, new media discussion, because I know we were talking about it last week um, as we were getting ready for this, um, there still is a big place for old media. We all talk about streaming and, and these new players, but can you walk me through how, how, we can, how we can bring some of this older media along with us in this, in this big wave that's been created? And how do we collaborate instead of just compete and forget about the past? And how do we enable um, some of the Canadian dominant players, and not just Cana Canadian, but international dominant players that are looking for new ways to, to advance and progress their business? Absolutely. So I think, um, you know, we Chorus, CTV, CP, CBC, as it pertains to Canada, still have a huge footprint here. Um, and in fact, only this week, cable subscriptions went up again. And I think it's because people are starting to miss some of the shows that they loved on cable. I think there's a place for everybody in um, the new need for content. Um, it's exploding. People have so many devices to watch it on, the bandwidth. I think there's a way to collaborate and, and uh, you know, bring it forward. As it, you know, with regards to Thunderbird, we are particularly sticky because we have a strong kids and family division. And so I think I see people focusing on kids and family on every media, be it cable, uh, you know, traditional broadcast, uh, OTT, the streamers, because they know if you can glue uh, kids and family, then people aren't going to sort of subscribe for Stranger Things and then unsubscribe. If your kid's begging to watch Beat Bugs, you're going to stay glued to the channel. And then the reach, you know, is, is tremendous. So um, you and a few other uh, of, of the management team talk about kind of the success of Peppa the Pig. Um, and this is a, a, a kid's property, child property, that uh, is worth over a billion dollars now. Can you, can you walk us through, how does that happen? How, how, how does, how does a, a company create or option or uh, acquire something like Peppa the Pig build the brand, do the merchandise, all, all this stuff. How, how do you kind of take that from root to fruit to creating a billion dollars of value in this business? Yeah, and that's why companies like E1 that have Peppa Pig or PJ Masks have that huge evaluation today. Um, and, you know, I think Frank Justra always said, if you keep hitting singles, eventually you'll hit the, the grand slam. You know, Lionsgate was was only, I think it was a $7 stock until Hunger Games hit, and then it just took off. So you'd never really know when that brand will hit. So looking for brands that have a proven following, um, you know, that's why we're optioning New York Times bestsellers. Uh, they already have a buzz around them. Um, and, you know, getting the increased buzz through an entertainment um, vehicle, a show. And then uh, owning all those rights so that you can then translate it into all the ancillary businesses, uh, you know, games, master toy deals, merch, consumer products. Um, the upside is the sky's the limit. Awesome. Um, well, I think we're, we're pretty well uh, wrapping up here. I, I'd just like to mention that um, we've mentioned Lionsgate Films a couple times. So Lionsgate is actually named after the Lionsgate Bridge. It was founded by Frank Justra. It's now the world's largest independent film studio, over $5 billion market cap. Um, and you know, we, we have major ambitions at Thunderbird. 
Uh, it's under $100 million market cap today, over $60 million in revenue, over $10 million of EBITDA. Um, and, and that's just kind of this baseline as I look at it as an investor to just hitting these singles until as one of these intellectual properties that we've incubated uh, at the company uh, hit that grand slam. Uh, and we've been lucky enough at Fiori to, to hit um, a couple grand slams, Lithium X. We we're also early days, Hive blockchain, which went from zero to $2 billion market cap. Uh, unfortunately, the blockchain market came off, but um, you know, we, we really see these trends early. We try to back the best management teams in the space. We only get behind one, one company in that space. And we are believers. Um, as insiders, I've been buying uh, stock in the last couple weeks. So has Frank. So has our other partner, Zim Jamal, which sold his care home business for $1.6 billion uh, last year as well. So we're very excited, Jen. We're happy to be here. Jay, thanks for having us. And I hope you guys learned something today. I think we've got about uh, eight minutes for questions, if anyone has any questions.